So welcome back after your reading. Hopefully you have gone and read up to the first intermission of the story. Let's go ahead and take a quick look and scroll through that story to see what you've looked at. So here's a copy of uh, your story of what you looked at here. And let's just scroll through part one. I'll briefly point out a few things here for you. Alrighty, we knew it was about an hour long broadcast between 8 and 9 p.m. Uh, broadcast over the air on October the 30th, 1938, toward the end of October. It starts with announcers, and these are the radio announcers from the CBS, and introduces right here, the very beginning, Orson Welles and his Mercury Theater, which uh, had we scheduled and regularly scheduled programming uh, every week. And so they were always putting out a new radio theater uh, production. That was their job. That's what they did. So they were radio actors. Alrighty. In the beginning, we have Orson Welles himself. He is the producer and director uh, uh, of this production company. And he comes in person, Orson Welles, to introduce this with his voice. And uh, we'll come back to this a little bit later, but it's like this poetic introduction to this uh, amazing story, Orson H.G. Uh, Wells' War of the Worlds. But it's neat here how he transitions. It was near the end of October. Business was better. The war scare was over. More men were back at work. And by the way, more on this war scare here, uh, maybe a little bit later, uh, because I kind of want to set this, set this uh, tone to say, well, what setting are we in real life history? We're at the end of the 1930s. And what is the global threat at the end of the 1930s? Aside from going through the Great Depression and all of that uh, and the dirty 30s and such, okay, what's happening at the end of the 1930s? Okay, hopefully you know. In any case, on this particular evening, October 30th, the Crossley Service, blah, 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 he sets up the story to come right back to our own time period, October 30th. And so then the story suddenly is told, not literally told right now, uh, because it is being told right now, but literally told right now, because the story itself happens as it's being told, like it actually is meant to happen as it's being told. And guess who you have back here? An announcer, the radio announcer, and the, the radio announcer comes back in. So what you end up happening here is that he simulates the story, getting jumping right into the story with this you know, little uh, obscure weather report from an announcer. So it sounds like radio. You get in the pi picture here? So I, I kind of love this. It's really cheesy. They go through, you got some music, bunch of announcers jumping in with different reports. Okay. You have a little flash news reports happening through the beginning point in time. Okay. I think eventually it's really kind of neat because they have this guy going on site doing recordings uh, with people on live radio. The first guy he talks to is this guy named Pearson, Professor Pearson, who's looking through this telescope. Tick tock, and you hear the ticking of the, of the clockwork of the uh, telescope following the stars. You have this commentary here with this professional, Professor Pearson. Okay, and eventually we have uh, some... Uh, more uh, reports happening here, okay? And then uh, we go and just look at regular music, just playing on the radio, okay? And then suddenly we're on site and it's this crazy sirens and police, okay? We, we, uh, we kind of get a visual description of the site uh, where this thing has landed. Uh, I like how there is Wilmoth, probably my favorite character, which we'll talk about in a second. <laughs> the farmer and they have a little report with this normal citizen. Okay. You have this uh, gesture of, uh, of, of wonder and awe at this thing that it's, they're trying to explain and describe and your imagination is just flowing as to what are they seeing? Uh, so give us a little bit of an idea of what radio drama can do because what can radio drama do is force you to visualize the picture, which is always going to be a more powerful image than somebody uh, uh, visualizing that for you, like on a TV screen, which we see today. Now, I shouldn't say that too quickly. I think today we've lost the skill of imagining things for ourselves just because we let movie directors do it for us. And that's a extreme tragedy. But that is my English teacher 
opinion. Okay, now we have this still at the Wilmoth farm and then suddenly we get an announcer. They've lost, they've lost the, uh, okay, they are here. Okay, so they're almost losing the, uh, the broadcast here. So they get Phillips back on and then uh, you have the crash of microphone as the fire begins to be shooting out of this thing. So really cool. Um, and you get this mysterious thing that's that's coming out and actually destroying the people who are around it. All right. The story then takes a very different turn from there uh, because it, it doesn't go on live location anymore, but it does have this uh, updates coming in to the main broadcasting hub uh, and you've got have these announcers then giving up, providing updates from here on in. And uh, you have updates from different authorities like Smith. Who is Smith? The commander of the state militia. Okay. Uh, so you have different uh, military authorities coming on air. And then uh, you have uh, Pearson being reconnected to. Is this by phone, I believe? Direct wire, Professor Pearson, who comes back, uh, even though even though uh, who is at uh, Phillips is uh, nowhere to be found. We can infer what happened to him. Okay, as we make our way through, we have uh, different uh, people coming to speak on, like this guy, this uh, McDonald dude, and uh, he seems to be like the uh, the guy who says that the Entire broadcasting facilities of the CBS are going to be handed over to the military, to the militia for their operations to help defend the world or, or the state or whatever against these things that have landed there, these Martian things that have landed there. And then so then you have the, the show turning into kind of a military communications update and broadcast and whatever. Okay. You see this. It's like a firsthand account of what's happening. Um, right from the um, Captain Lansing and the state militia. You get the update from them. And then uh, hold on, and it kind of cuts out, comes back to the announcers. Okay, you get updates of reports coming into the radio uh, of where these other additional ones have been viewed and, and uh, uh, seen. So you've got multiple cylinders then landing across the country. And then this is an interesting point. Because I want to point this out. The secretary comes. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation. Uh, apparently, this was meant to sound like Roosevelt at the time, which I believe, I think it was Roosevelt, uh, the president um, of, of the United States at the time. Okay. Whatever it was, it was a familiar third of voice that was being mimicked, and the people were really upset with this particular part of the story because the secretary comes on and makes a public announcement to the whole nation. Okay? In the meantime, placing our faith in God, we must continue to perform our... Okay, there is... The military will do stuff, but in the meantime, when all else fails, place your faith in God. Like, that's a pretty dire statement to say. Uh, it sounds pretty hopeless. Not to say God's hopeless, but I think when your last resort is prayer and faith in God, uh, it means that that's your last resort. It's pretty, pretty dire. Okay. Uh, eventually, we get down to some more announcers and updates and things like that. And I want to get to the part where, aha, where you have the officer and gunner because you've got guys positioned up in the hills and the radio then goes to their communications as they're like sniping this thing down with their cannon. And you get the boom and the fire and the shots and blah, blah, blah. And, the, you know, as they, they're dialing in on these things, walking across uh, quite, quite a ways in the distance. They do hit one. Uh, these are tripod, it says. It's tripod of one of them. So they're like a three-legged thing that walks along. And the idea is that that's the machine that the Martian's traveling in. It's not the Martian itself. The Martians are, like, inside. But that's the ship that then converts from, like, a, a spaceship and rises up into this tripod monster uh, uh, vehicle with its crazy uh, heat ray. Okay. They can shoot flame without you seeing. It's like a flame laser beam. Okay. Now, at this point, you see the first observation of, oh, look at they're letting off a smoke. 
And so not only do they have this devastating weapon of that heat ray, but they have the smoke that they release and the smoke then goes down and circulates amongst the people put on masks yet they start coughing and then eventually they cough and you don't hear any more from them so what is that gas we have to make this inference of what that gas is doing okay we have uh then it fly uh fly it, it, it the radio broadcast changes completely to go to a, a army bomber commander and it's a report from pilots in these bombers And they're trying to uh, fight these things, but eventually, okay, all crashed, one enemy machine destroyed. The heat ray is, the sound of the heat ray, heat ray is taking out the planes even. So when your air uh, support is even being taken out by these things, it seems to me it says, uh, now the engine's gone, eight. Um, and then, uh, what did it say? They're... Uh, no chance to release the bombs. Only one thing left. Drop on them, plane and all. So what are they doing? They're kamikaze it into these things. The planes, engines are failed. They can't release the bombs. So what do you do? You crash right into it. And they do end up taking one right out. So there's an interesting example of heroism, of taking that plane and crashing it right into one of those machines, the Martians. Okay, and then you have all these operators trying to communicate. And presumably they're calling these people who aren't responding. And eventually, you only have one guy left. There's nobody else to communicate. So all communications down, either those people are taken out or their li communication lines are cut and they can't communicate. And then eventually, we get back to the CBS building in New York City. This is the broadcast building, and the announcer has done one last ditch thing. He's climbed to the roof, and you can hear the bells ringing in the city and the crowds below. And he's on the top of the roof in New York looking out and giving you a live update narrative of what's happening. We know that those Martian ships have been heading in the direction of New York and eventually they convene there and come into the city. And it says exactly, he describes exactly what they end up doing. Okay. And he describes the situation of the crowded streets of the voices in the, and the church singing and hymns and bells uh, of the churches going and then he describes how these uh, machines come over the horizon and then what do they do they re they release their smoke across the city and he gives that update sixth avenue okay now that smoke has come to fifth avenue and then it's 50 feet away and then you hear the clunk the live clunk of his fall and you have to make an inference of what happens there Okay, just in case you haven't been able to make the inference, he dies because of the smoke, even from the top of that building that has uh, kind of come across the whole city. Presumably anybody in its path is being killed by it. And then you have this operator come back on the air. Is there anyone on the air? Is anyone? He's like well, the last guy alive, it seems, who's on the air broadcasting. And then you have an announcer coming back in to say, hey, you're listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles in the Mercury Theater on the air. In an original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, performance will continue after a brief intermission. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. And then maybe they have an intermission there, some ads and stuff like that. And that's part one of the story. So make sure you read up to that or have read up to that. That's a brief look at this. Let's go back to our slides. And... Let's come back to our slides and do our post reading as we look at part one of War of the Worlds. So our part one review is, first of all, identifying some of the characters here. So do you pick up on who Ramon Raquello is? You remember who he is? Okay, he's an obscure figure at the beginning of the story, the conductor in that live orchestra with that amazing orchestra music at the very beginning of the story. Okay, Phillips. Do you remember who Phillips is? Phillips was that on-site reporter who uh, risked his life for true journalism and live journalism. Revolutionary how back in 1938, you could have live uh, reporters going out and doing live stories from out of a studio. That's very interesting how that could happen. Please don't ask me how. I do know that when I was growing up in Prince Albert, that uh, you would have the 
local FM radio out and about at a given hour of the day. And you could stop them in their car, like driving around, you could stop them in their car and request a song and they would, they would interact and broadcast right from the seat of their car. So, I mean, we, we know we can broadcast from on site today as well uh, over the radio, but Phillips, he was that guy. Who was Pearson? Pearson is the professor. He begins at the observatory looking out at Mars, uh, and then he ends up going to explore Grover's mill. And he's on site when the Martian comes out of this cylinder at Grover's mill. Who's Wilmoth? Wilmoth, we remember, is the awesome farmer. Everybody always remembers Farmer Wilmoth. Okay, it's his land that the Martian lands on and all the spectators come to check out. Okay, let's take a look at Smith. Smith is the uh, General Montgomery Smith, was the commander of the state militia in Trenton, New Jersey. I think he had a lot of confidence that they could take this thing out with their numbers, but they end up getting obliterated and nobody lives. McDonald. McDonald was the vice president of the CBS. He gives over control of the radio to the military, uh, and uh, that is his role. We had the, uh, I, the guy named Lansing. He was the captain of the Signal Corps and the state militia. They were at Grover's Mill. We infer that they all perish and that these guys um, uh, did not succeed in defending their um, territory, their militia region. Okay, and then there's that uh, guy by the name of Secretary, which we don't want to forget either. He gives this kind of dire public announcement of what's going on there. Of course, we have various other announcers. We have a policeman, some military men, other opera various operators and announcers that are communicating back and forth. We've got that pilot uh, and whatnot, the gunners and stuff. Okay. Now, what did part one imitate in the way it was dramatized? Well, right off the bat, we get kicked into a current state and time, right in October 30th, the same day it was broadcast and we get a weather report, and then we get live music from an orchestra, and then we get news updates, and then we get on-site reporting, and then we get frequent updates from the military uh, saying the progression of live action news. So what is it dramatized like? Well, it's dramatized like a radio news report or flash-in kind of break in, breaking news report. That's the way it's dramatized. And it's an interesting thing to make a radio play mimic a radio real-life news broadcast. A kind of creative, uh, interesting thing to try to do. Number three, what qualities of the dramatization made it believable to the audience? Well, what things did you think up that made it believable? We've already mentioned quite the same number of those things, like, well, it broadcast the weather. I thought it was real. Okay, it had uh, military figures. They speak authoritatively. He had a, uh, a professor if I'm going to trust a professor, and what he has to say on something. They had on-site reporting that sounded really, really real. They had um, uh, the secretary come on and give this announcement in the in mimicking the voice of you know our president. Uh, so these are things that okay. They had the bells of the city and town and up, utter uproar. I thought it was a real live recording. Okay. Uh, they had the sounds of the planes, the sounds of the guns going off. Uh, these are things that made it sound real. Okay. Uh, so there's there's all these things that made it sound believable. And a lot of the audience was duped by that. I don't think I asked this question, but let's just pause here because I didn't ask this question. And usually I say, okay, well, how was it not believable? How did you know it was just a story? And some people might say this. Well, the story says it's not a story. Uh, sorry, the story says it is a story and that it's not real. The beginning. Okay. Another one is the time frame. First of all, it happens very quickly if we look at the literal time flow of the story. But we know that that sequence of events would take place in real in real in reality over the course of hours, not the course of half an hour. Okay. So that should have been a hint. Another one that's very good is that uh, Phillips goes from the observatory in Princeton and drives to Wilmoth's farm in like two minutes if you go and look at the time stamp of the story. So the timing is off, okay? 
Um, another might be you look out the window and you say, hey, I don't see any of this happening, especially if you're in your New York in a high rise or something and you look out, and you're like, oh, the radio's saying that these monsters on the horizon, I don't see them at all. So that might be one thing that makes you realize, oh, it's just a dramatization. So number four is, can we begin to understand why the newspapers reported the listeners' reactions to the story back in 1938 as realistic as they did? Well, I think so. And that would be looking at the people who would have tuned in maybe a little bit late and realized that, or didn't realize that it was just a story. And they actually were duped to thinking that the radio was giving them a real story. That is very much likely. Okay. I hope that has been a good look at the first part of the story. I hope more so that you've just enjoyed the story for the story's sake and that you have grasped and have been able to follow a little bit of, of what we've been discussing here. But it's time to get back into reading. And so I'm going to set you up to go ahead and get back into the story, to access that script again, to read from the first intermission, which I believe we said was page 20, now and read to the end. Now you'll note that actually the majority of the story is part one and that the end, the conclusion comes relatively quickly at this point onward. So there's not much more to read in terms of the story, but you're also going to note that it changes tone a little bit and it actually is a bit of a different uh, style of telling that story from here on in. And yet it does have this conclusion and as you get back into it, we should be thinking, okay, this part one was the utter obliteration of the earth. There is no hope and there is no possible way that the story could end in anything but terrible and bad. And that could actually be our prediction and it could actually be true as well. So we have utter hopelessness in the flow of the story because humans are completely at the mercy of these Martians that have come through. The radio show and the radio broadcasting station as we know it has been destroyed and there's nobody else left on the air and the radio at this point has been kind of disabled. Interestingly enough, the uh, announcer comes in, the intermission happens and we get right back into the radio. Why? Because this is just fiction and the radio actually still does work, even the radio, even though the radio show itself destroyed the radio. All right, go ahead, read part two, and again, read it on your own, and then go and listen to the recording and follow along in your book a second time. And once you do that, come back, we will take it up from there. And what would that be, part four? All right, see you in a bit. Don't be lame. DBL, guys.